Happy to be here. Happy to be in Indiana, out of my house. I think I might be the first comedian to ever say that, by the way. <laughs> Indiana does live up to some of the stereotypes. I'll say that about Indiana. I got on the airplane and this woman came up to me and she goes, I don't want to make this weird, but you look exactly like my brother. <laughs> and I have this thing that I say, because I'm from the Northwest, like a lot of people look like me in the Northwest. I look like a lot of people's brothers, okay? And in Indiana, I look like a lot of you. <laughs> Every table in here just looks like my family in different costumes. <laughs> So I'm used to this. I'm used to people telling me this. So I came up with this. It's like kind of a hacky line, but they'll say, you look like so-and-so. And I go, that guy sounds hot. <laughs> she goes, you look like my brother. And I go, that guy sounds hot. And she goes, he is. <laughs> and she didn't break eye contact. I lost incest chicken on that airplane, okay? <laughs> I'm the most happy to be here though and out of my house because uh, two years ago, my wife gave birth to our first child. Thank you, yeah, I appreciate that, thank you, thank you. We gave her up for adoption, but thank you so much. It was still really nice to hear you clap about it, that was great. Felt really good for me. We didn't give her up. We sold her. You guys know how much you can get for a white baby these days? I would have been stupid not to sell her, I'm rich now. I don't have to work anymore. That's not true, we kept her, and I have to work all the fucking time. They're so expensive, <laughs> these babies. My wife went into labor. It was very stressful for us. I think it was more stressful for my wife than it was for me, but I'm here in Indiana with a microphone, so I'm gonna give you all the very coveted male side of child delivery. I drove my wife to the hospital, and when we arrived at the hospital, the doctor immediately reached her hand inside of my wife's vagina, and then started giving us measurements from the inside of my wife's vagina. In the metric system, by the way. <laughs> like they were installing a granite countertop up there. I don't know why we have to be so precise and Canadian about these vagina measurements. And then she tells all the nurses in the room. She goes, uh, seven centimeters dilated. 80% effaced. She walks out into the hallway. She tells all of her friends out there. She goes, room four, seven centimeters dilated. 80% effaced. And I send one picture of my wife's vagina to one of my friends and I'm an asshole? What, is she just making the rules up as she goes? That doesn't seem fair. It was a blurry picture. When it came time for my wife to push, the doctor looked at me and she goes, hey Casey, grab a leg. And I go, oh, fuck. Did we fill the paperwork out wrong? Because we have medical insurance. And I didn't read it closely, but I thought it covered personnel for both legs. I don't think I'm qualified for this job. I don't want to do this. And so I grabbed the leg. I was fucking great, by the way. I was like the Michael Jordan of holding that leg. But nobody cared. My wife had a mostly complication-free childbirth. She gets done, they dump a bucket of Gatorade on her or whatever they do. At the end, I wasn't paying close attention. And Michael Jordan sitting on the bench. Nobody gives a shit. I didn't even get a pat on the back, okay? They didn't even let me hold the trophy for a while. She did have a mostly complication-free childbirth, but she was in labor for 20 hours. I know, that's a long time. And by the time she gave birth to our daughter, we had actually been awake for 36 straight hours. And when, when they finally let us sleep, they had finished all the tests on our daughter, we had been awake for 48 straight hours. And I remember that night very vividly because I was emotionally and physically exhausted, but also somehow more emotionally full than I've ever been in my entire life. And I'm looking down at my daughter in the bassinet, and it, life feels so fragile that first night. And I'm staring down at this person who just a couple hours ago, I didn't know who she was. And now I know that I'm gonna love her for the rest of my life. And that night, I woke up every 15 minutes just to make sure my daughter was still alive. And then last night I was home. I woke up every 15 minutes 
because she wouldn't stop fucking reminding us that she's still alive. <laughs> They're so fucking annoying, these kids. I didn't know she was gonna be this annoying. I'm not naive, I knew she'd be annoying, but what to expect when you're expecting to start with? They're gonna be really fucking annoying for a long time. Longer than you think, buckle up. And they're stupid, did you guys know that? No one told me that, I didn't know that every baby was stupid, but I have definitive proof now, okay? This might not be popular in this room, but every baby is stupid. You were all stupid babies, every one of you. I was a stupid baby, Einstein was a stupid baby. You might have babies at home, and they're miracles, but they're fucking morons, okay? <laughs> they have markers of intelligence for babies, and they're complete bullshit. Like, my daughter smiled one month before developmentally a child is supposed to be able to smile. My wife and I looked at each other, and we go, oh my God, she's a genius. And then I thought about it for one second, and some of the stupidest people I know smile all the time. That's not a good marker of intelligence, okay? My daughter has this like ever expanding vocabulary. Every week I get home and my daughter has learned dozens of new words. It's inspiring, it's beautiful, it's amazing. But also every week I catch my daughter trying to eat water with a fork. This is not a fucking genius, okay? And it's not just my daughter, it's your kids too. And this is how I know. Because at three weeks old, a baby dog a puppy starts walking. At six weeks old, a baby bird leaves the nest to support itself for the rest of its life. When my daughter was six months old, she could barely support her own stupid head. Sometimes when you talk to a vegan, they'll tell you that you shouldn't eat pork. It's immoral to eat pork because a mature pig is as smart as a three-year-old child. That's a good argument to stop eating pork. That's a better argument to start eating three-year-old children. What the fuck are we waiting for? Have you seen how tender they look? How come no one in Texas is slow-smoking toddlers right now? I said uh, doctor earlier, and uh, the first show that I ever did after my wife gave birth, I told that joke, and when I said doctor, a woman in the audience yelled out. She goes, midwife! And I was like, no, doctor. And she goes, no, midwife. And I go, no, doctor. She goes, no, midwife. I go, listen, lady, shut the fuck up. I don't care. If I say midwife, it doesn't change the joke. I'll say midwife. Just please stop talking during this comedy show. And then she approached me after the show, this very woman. And it turns out that she was the midwife that delivered our daughter. <laughs> the very woman that delivered our daughter. And she goes, Casey, I really apologize. I should not have yelled out during a comedy show. I know that was wrong. But midwives are very proud to be midwives. We're not doctors. We do a lot of the same things, but we're not doctors. And I go, I understand that. But comedians, they sometimes change small, store, small parts of a story so that everybody in the room can understand the story. Like, I don't think every dude in here knows exactly what a midwife does. And the reason I think that is because when my wife and I went to our first doctor's appointment, I walked up to the counter first, and the woman at the counter goes, are you here to see your midwife? <laughs> to me. And I was like, that's a really rude thing to say to me in front of my first wife. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> You're gonna ruin this for both of us. It didn't happen for us right away. Uh, I was trying to get my wife pregnant for three years, which I can tell by your reaction is too long. Not a support group, I get that now. <laughs> three years is a long time, and that's hard on a couple, and we're not stronger than other couples. It was hard on us also. But what I realized in those three years is that it was hard on my wife and I for very different reasons. Like, it was hard on my wife because she was actively trying not to get pregnant. <laughs> that whole time. It was hard on me because if you guys ever tried to break a condom using only the power of positive thinking, <laughs> it's very difficult, it turns out. I've wanted kids for a long time and I think for responsible reasons. The first reason is I love my wife so much. She's my favorite person in the world. She's the kindest person I know and I just wanted to trap her in my life forever. <laughs> 
you guys have known me for a little while now. I'm not bringing a lot to this relationship, okay? So I needed a fucking anchor to keep her there. And I did it. I put the anchor in that lady. The other reason I've wanted kids for a long time is that for many years, my wife and I lived in this apartment building that wouldn't let us get a dog. Did you guys know that when you have a kid, they don't even make you put down a pet deposit? It's an incredible deal. We didn't have a dog and we didn't have kids, but we did have a cat. From the time we started dating, my wife was trying to convince me that this cat was our child. But the only way he was like our child at all is that we disagreed on how to raise him. Like I was giving him treats one day and my wife walked in the room and she goes, why are you doing that? He didn't do anything to earn those. And I go, listen lady, I have no fucking idea why I'm doing this. This is my first cat. I don't know how else to bond with him. He's got limited functionality. He's like a flip phone with fur. Also, what are the possible negative consequences of this transaction? If I give this cat treats he didn't earn, he's not gonna learn discipline, get good grades, get into a good college, start a life of his own. No, he's a cat. My wife's expectations are too high for this cat. But my wife, the same woman, every day gives the same cat a fresh batch of refrigerator cold, filtered water. And every day when I get home, the same cat is sitting on our dinner table, chewing on his own asshole. <laughs> People of Indiana, I'm not here to tell you how to raise your kids, okay? But in my house, when one of my kids starts mainlining their own asshole, I stop worrying about what's in their water. Drink a little fluoride, we have bigger problems, okay? He's not my biological cat. He's my wife's cat from a past relationship. I raise him like my own. He doesn't know the difference. That's fine. Hold your applause. Not all heroes wear capes. We do get some weird looks when we take our cat to the vet though, because I'm white and my wife is white and our cat is half black. Wow, it's 2022 and Indiana's not ready for my family? Are you fucking kidding me? The stereotypes were true again. <laughs> we actually did, um, we did get a dog a couple years ago. She's a really sweet dog. She's a uh, Border Collie mix, which you know they have, they have those like hybrid names for dogs now, like a Labradoodle is a Lab and a Poodle, it's kind of dumb. Our dog is a Border Collie mix, so they call her a uh, Pit Bull. <laughs> She's great. She's an amazing dog. She's very gentle with my daughter, but I'm not here to tell you that every Pit Bull belongs with every two-year-old, okay? My wife and I are not responsible dog owners. That's what I'm here to tell you. We just went on the internet and we were like, look how cute this dog is on the internet. Can you imagine how cute she would look in our living room? And then we put her there and we fucking nailed it. She's so cute in her living room. In fact, the other day I was watching TV and I was like getting distracted by how cute my dog was. I'm watching TV and I'm like, oh shit, is that dog? She's so cute. Why did nobody want this dog? Why do we have to rescue this dog? In fact, is this dog a 10? Some of you might not be familiar with the one to 10 scale of attractiveness, but I was like, is this dog a 10? And then I took her to the dog park. She's a living room 10. She's like a dog park five and a half, okay? Listen, you'd fuck her, you just wouldn't tell your friends about it, okay? Cannibalism and bestiality, we made it. Proud of you guys. My, uh, my wife was pregnant for most of 2019, and I think that's the best time there's ever been to be the husband in that circumstance. Because before that, you had to buy a bunch of embarrassing shit as a man if you cared for your partner at all, and I got to buy all that shit on Amazon. I never had to make eye contact with a high school senior at a drugstore that grew up in my town. You know what I mean? Because when you bring, the, I bought all the pregnancy tests on Amazon. When you bring the first pregnancy test to a drugstore counter, that 18 year old is not an empathetic figure in your life. All he's imagining is that if his girlfriend had to take that test, he might not get to go to college, okay? When you bring the sixth pregnancy test to that same drugstore counter, that high school senior is like, do you have a single fucking sperm in your body? What is wrong with you? Stop coming in here and start coming in your wife. 
They're doing this all wrong. I bought a sperm count test on Amazon for this joke. It was $35. I do not recommend it. I mean, it works. It said I have sperm and now I have a baby. That's a pretty good A to B test, okay? But you take for granted, like I bought it and I was like, I'm going to save so much money and embarrassment not going to a fertility clinic. And I saved exclusively money and no embarrassment at all. Because you take for granted everything they do for you at a fertility clinic that when you do it at home, you have to do it yourself, okay? Like the test starts out exactly the same. I'm jerking off into a cup. And I'm great at that, by the way. I've been practicing my whole life for that part of the test, okay? But at a fertility clinic, I run very little risk of my wife walking in on me administering the test at our dining table. She walked out of our bedroom and she goes, what the fuck are you doing right now? And I go, relax, baby, this is for both of us. And she goes, I don't know, this looks pretty self-indulgent to me. And why are there Latina MILFs on your computer screen? And I go, actually, baby, you should sit down. These are very good mothers. You could learn a thing or two. You see what they're willing to do to make ends meet for their family? You won't even do that for me on my birthday. And then after that, that's where the similarities end. Like, at a fertility clinic, a nurse or a janitor comes in, they collect your jar of cum, and then they shuttle it off from testing station to testing station. At a fertility clinic, for one day, you're like the king of ejaculation. At home, all of a sudden, I have to start a small business in my dining room. Like, I've never, I've never gone so quickly from orgasming to being a lab technician. I had to set a timer, I had to stir in a solution to stabilize the sample. I didn't know what fork I was ready to throw away that day. Her flatware, her choice is in the Bible, I think. I don't think, I think she should get a say in that. I don't know, I just haven't done science with an erection since middle school. I'm still no good at it. That's... I told one of my friends, my wife and I were trying to have a kid and he goes, uh, oh, gross. And I was like, why would you say gross? And he goes, I don't know, man. It just feels to me like when a married couple announces they're trying to have a kid, it's like you guys are just bragging to the world that you two are fucking a lot. <laughs> Which that's not exciting to me. Like, I've had dinner with that lady. And I go, first off, I have bad news about the dining table. <laughs> we actually had to burn it to the ground a couple weeks ago. <laughs> And he goes, yeah, if you're cheating, tell me the story, but otherwise, I don't want to hear about your boring married sex. Because that's, my friend thinks about sex the way that a single person thinks about sex. For him, sex is spontaneous, passionate sex that he wants to have every single time. And when you're trying to have a kid, that is not what sex is like, okay? When we were trying to have a kid, it was like, like I was a surgical assistant and my wife was the lead surgeon. And I've been late to every surgery for weeks. And she's noting in my performance review, by the way. She's been very vocal with the higher ups. They're considering making a change at the position, actually. But I happen to have the only scalpel in the hospital. At least I hope I have the only scalpel in the hospital. So there's a lot of pressure on a man to perform sexually through that process. And I turned to performance enhancing drugs. Erectile dysfunction medication. You can buy that online too, by the way. I bought the pills and I told that same friend about it. I was like, I bought these pills online. And he goes, oh dude, you're in your 30s and your dick already doesn't work? And I was like, oh my God, you were out of the running for Godfather. You are not a good friend. And I was like, no, my dick works. I just need my dick to work harder. Like, my dick works like it has job security. I need my dick to work like he's a college intern. And he's the first one in his family to go to college. And if he doesn't graduate and get a job, his parents are gonna lose their house. My dick works like it has seniority in a labor union. Like, my dick works like it has a gray beard and a bad attitude. He's been driving a forklift for 35 years. Every time I ask my dick to work overtime, he's like, I'm just here to double dip on my pension, motherfucker. Get out of my face.
I feel like uh, my wife and I are kind of falling behind sexually since we had our daughter. Like people are so adventurous sexually now and we're just not those people anymore. Like did you guys know that people are eating ass? I don't know if that's made it out to Indiana, okay? But I don't, I'm sorry. Some of you are finding this out for the first time right now. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, okay? I didn't want to be that. I just feel like I need to spread awareness. I think, I'll, I'll make it clear. I'm against it, okay? I don't think you should do it. I think it's gross. But I think that if you weren't aware of it, you should be happy to be aware of it because it might happen in your next sexual encounter and you might not have known what's coming. So now head on a swivel. That's what I'm saying. Seven years ago, hip-hop music popularized eating ass. And seven years, for seven years, white people have been trying very hard to catch up. And it's not going great for us, by the way. We don't make it look very cool. Seven years ago, a woman named Janae Aiko sung in a song that for a man to be sexually attractive to her, the minimum requirements for sexual viability, that guy has to eat the booty like groceries. Yeah, okay. This is the only show where they've recognized that song. I want to make that clear. But that lady, Janae Aiko, does not know how I eat groceries. If I was going to eat Janae Aiko's booty the way that I eat groceries, I would have to go to the grocery store, and one of the first things I learned about the grocery store is when you get to the grocery store, all the healthiest stuff is on the outside, all the bad stuff is in the middle. I think the analogy holds pretty well for eating ass up to that point. But if I was going to eat Janae Aiko's booty the way that I specifically eat groceries, I would have to go to the grocery store, buy a lot of Janae Aiko's booty, bring it home, and let it expire in my refrigerator. That is not the sexy treatment that Janae Aiko is looking for, okay? I don't know, so my younger friends, they all just think I'm like this old prude now, because I won't eat ass. Like my buddy, he's like, I get it, you're married, but you wouldn't even eat your wife's ass? And I go, buddy, when I was growing up, they told us it wasn't even safe to drink out of a garden hose. <laughs> and now you want me to put my mouth on that orifice? That feels like a big leap to me. Philosophically, at least, that's a big leap. <laughs> And he goes, fine, Case, you wouldn't eat your wife's ass. That's a personal taste thing. I could respect that. But you wouldn't let your wife eat your ass? And I go, buddy, that is not how the negotiations would go. <laughs> it's not like I get home every day and my wife is like, get those pants down, get that ass up. Mama's hungry. And every day I'm just running around my house swatting her hand away. That's never happened in my house one time, okay? And what this guy doesn't realize is that my wife is a very picky eater. It took me seven years to get my wife to try sushi, okay? I'm not getting her mouth on my ass in one conversation. And it's not like this is a certified organic, free range, cage free, sustainably farmed ass, okay? This is chocked full of preservatives, genetically modified, factory farmed ass. And this guy, this guy that thinks that I should be eating my wife's ass and she should be eating my ass as shows of love, and then talking about it in public, that guy, he won't even eat gluten. All right, thank you guys so much. I'm Casey McLean. <laughs> you guys have been very fun. I have a couple shirts for sale after the show, and I promise they don't have my dick on them. <laughs> one of them... One of them says, uh, Not my biological cat. The other one says, uh, Living Room 10. I saw who walked in here today. There's some living room tens out there. I mean, who the fuck am I to talk? They shouldn't have let me out of the green room, but... Those are both my actual pets. 
you might have noticed that they're actually both half white and half black. I was so happy my daughter didn't come out that way. 